good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, I know everyone's coming back from lunch. I feel like my job at this point is to keep you awake. <laughs> um, I want to welcome you to Savannah. My name is Sean Brandon. Uh, I'm the Director of Mobility and Parking Services, otherwise known as the most popular person in the city <laughs> of Savannah. Um, <laughs> uh, and I want to talk to you. We're, the, the, I'm the first speaker. Our second speaker will be about 20 minutes. We'll both be about 20 minutes, and then we'll allow the last 20 minutes for questions. Um, so, uh, as I said before, I, I'm probably the most popular person in Savannah, and, and we're going to go through uh, some pretty significant changes that we've done as a city uh, over the past six months. Uh, and we're a little bit of a peach tree dish because the, the changes went into effect really in January and now we're just starting to get the data in. And the fact that we can get data at all is, is, is the first miracle of what we're doing. Um, so I just want to give you a, just a little bit of an overview. Um, we do about 3,000 regulated on-street spaces. 2,100 of those spaces are parking kiosks, those the large, the somewhat large black boxes that you see out that our residents love, uh, primarily because uh, they take credit, debit cards, um, they're linked to an app that you can use in your phone. We have five garages. Um, we're a little bit rare uh, in that uh, a lot of cities, particularly of our size, uh, are not the dominant off-street uh, parking provider. Usually that's the private sector. But our history is one in which we have built garages out to the point where we have about 3,000 off-street spaces, uh, five lots, that's about another 400 spaces, um, and then uh, we contract with Chad and Maria Tran Transit for express shuttles, which I will talk a, quite a bit about a little later on. It's about 25 to 30,000 folks per month uh, riding those. Um, so Savannah, welcome. Uh, uh, you will probably hear, as it is a broken record, this is a mixed use environment. This is, you have typically storefront retail, maybe on the first level, maybe you have offices on the second, maybe there's a condo on the third. And that's been our history of, of these uses mixing together. Um, and one of the roles of what I do is try to take all those uses and have them actually coexist for the limited amount of curbside space that is sitting out there. Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the psychology of parking. Uh, and we'll get to this because we did a whole, we did two years worth of surveying for, for people who were parking downtown on a regular basis. And so the psychology of parking usually is um, I have come down, I've come to this area and I cannot find a parking space anywhere. I, I, this, is, this is intolerable. We have to do something. And then you really start digging in and what you, this, what you start discovering is uh, everyone wants to park as close as where they, close to where they want to be for as little as it costs, and they're willing to do that for a very long time. <laughs> Even if there are other spaces. So a lot of times parking is seen on the supply side, and I'll get to that in just a second, uh, but I would make the case that a lot of this is more management. Management of what you've got rather than just what you're trying to build. Um, and particularly, I spent a few hours uh, yesterday. Uh, who here were, were in the autonomous vehicle sessions yesterday? Ah, yeah. So this whole dynamic is probably going to change. Um, so when we talk about parking, particularly here now, trying to build it out, just build more spaces, is not necessarily uh, what we want to do as a community. So um, why am I showing you streetcar lines from 1910? Because this is how people used to get around before we had cars in great numbers. Um, 
And if you can see, the, the street grid hasn't really changed. The streets that you're walking around now are pretty much the same streets that, that these lines were rolling on, the, the blue lines. Um, and there was a Bay Street line, uh, you, a Liberty Street line. You had one that basically took you down to Forsyth Park and beyond. Who here got to has made it out to Thomas Square or Starland? Any folks? That, that's the, they called it the streetcar district um, for a reason. Um, and the original lines went all the way out to the Isle of Hope. That's, why, that's how people originally got around in this city. I'm going to come back to this map because uh, the reason I focus on this in a little bit, you'll get it. <laughs> uh, all right, so this wasn't just us. This was most cities. Uh, hey, how do, you, how do you deal with parking? Pretty much all supply side. And the supply side says you build as much parking as you can for as cheaply as you can. Well, build as much parking as you can and offer it for as cheaply as you can. Because that's what everyone wants. That's the psychology of parking. Build it as close to where I want to go and uh, please don't charge me anything for it. <laughs> and that's a lot of what we initially did. Uh, one big thing, data. Uh, there was none of it. Uh, a, a single head parking meter, which you put in and is, is a mechanical meter, doesn't really give you any data. The only way to do data up until very recently, and by recent I mean probably the last 10, 15 years, was physically sending people out and doing occupancy studies. And that is an extremely labor intensive process that you, you, you don't get real time on. Uh, so a lot of this was divorced. Our parking was divorced from traffic, which was also divorced from transit. We, we, everything sort of in, a, in, in its own bubble. Uh, now, why do I say all that? Because there were some policy implications of that. Uh, when you start building, uh, staying entirely on supply side, you end up doing things that you regret. Uh, probably this is uh, uh, our biggest regret. Uh, that is, who has walked in Ellis Square? Ellis Square, it's where the fountain is. Yes, okay. Uh, th that's where our city market was. And we tore it down in the 50s to build a parking garage. <laughs> because at that point, everyone said, the reason that downtown is, is, is declining is because, well, there's not enough parking. So they literally, went to a square and said, well, no one's really using this building. It's old. It probably costs too much to bring it up. So let's just tear it down and build a parking garage. So that's what they did. A 510 space garage. Uh, so through the 60s and 70s, that, that garage existed. And uh, I would note that 1967, those are parking enforcement officers. Uh, but uh, downtown still declined. So they built this giant parking garage in the middle of the square we, and it, downtown still declined because ultimately it really wasn't about parking. <laughs> Thankfully, we as a community came to our senses. Uh, if you're in Ellis Square now, uh, what you may or may not realize is that there's, uh, that square has been restored the parking garage that was on top of it was torn down, and then we put a thousand parking spaces four levels down underneath Ellis Square. Who's been in that garage? I'm just curious. Okay. <laughs> so uh, two and a half, three, almost three years ago, uh, we commenced a process called Parking Matters, uh, because once again, uh, there was this sort of outcry of, we don't have enough spaces. We need to build more spaces. Uh, and uh, we contracted uh, with Nelson Nygaard, who I know is here prominently. There are some in the back. Uh, Symbiosity, I don't know if Denise Grabowski is here, but if you know her, she was a part of that team. Uh, and we work with our uh, MPO, uh, which is our planning commission. Uh, and we got actually federal money to do this study because we wanted to look at it holistically. Uh, and what we discovered was interesting. Uh, the, the, we already knew some of what was happening anecdotally 
Uh, I'm just giving you a typical street section, and this is, let's, let's say this is Broughton Street. And what, what was happening at that point on Broughton Street was it was free for three hours on one side of Broughton Street. And then, at the end of that three hours, the, there was one zone and then another zone. So what that basically meant was if you were a worker, you got there first on street, the most valuable spaces downtown, and you parked there. And then three hours later, you got in your car and you moved to the other side of Broughton Street. <laughs> That's how it existed for 20 years. Um, and so workers, because they knew the system really well, and I don't blame them at all, they were the ones who got on street. Uh, office workers got in garages and then frustrated customers typically ended up in garages. And we knew we, we had to start reversing that trend. And we knew that from the studies that we, that, that we conducted. Um, all right, so this is, this, was a, this is where we were. So how do you get this many designations of time limits versus how much you're charging. I mean, uh, we had 20 plus different designations. There were one hour, one dollar an hour spaces. There were three hour, 30 cent an hour spaces. There were all these different designations. Uh, and it was frankly just confusing. It was confusing for everyone, except if you worked downtown and you knew the system. Now, I, this doesn't really do it justice. Let's see what that looks like on a map. So if I was going to show you, hey, you're coming downtown, what does the system look like for where you can park and how long? <laughs> That's what it looked like. Um, so how did, how did this happen? Um, well, it was very, very noble intentions. Uh, you, let's say, own the UPS store. UPS store has a very specific clientele. They get there, they're there 15, maybe 30 minutes tops, then they get in the car and they leave. So you want the spaces in front of your business to be 30 minutes, no more. Pink house, your restaurant, your clientele, they want to eat. So you want them there, but you also realize you need a little bit of turnover for the lunch and dinner crowd. You asked for two hours, and we granted them all. And then over time, it started to look like this. <laughs> uh, and while it may have served each individual business on that particular block, it did not serve the system as a whole. And you, as someone coming into downtown, I, I cannot expect you to understand this. Um, we did a lot of surveying, uh, uh, lots of surveys. Um, and we asked a whole bunch of questions. We said, hey, uh, tell me what's important to you. What's important to you? Uh, and if you'll notice, by far number one, based on their priorities, not having to move my car until I leave. Now, why was that? That's why. <laughs> Uh, number two is ease of the certain where location can be into my destination. I think that's true. And then ease of finding a space. Interesting to note what was last on these five. Cost. Mm -hmm. Now that's not to say cost is not important, but it is to say that cost was not as important as these other three, four, I'm sorry. Uh, we asked the question, hey, how long do you park downtown? Uh, one to two hours, two to three, three to four, this was kind of your sweet spot. Uh, now, what was the problem with that? The problem was uh, that 68% of all of our meters were two hours or less. <laughs> that creates frustration. That again. <laughs> Uh, if on-street parking is frequently difficult to find, please select the time. And this is going to be interesting. I'm going to come back to this. Um, 
weekdays would be in green, and you can see sort of nine to three, but also six to nine. Uh, Saturday, which is held out of its own, you see the pattern is different. It actually gets worse as the day gets into evening. And then Sunday, well, yeah, that makes sense. That's your church crowd. So uh, we took that confusing map that you saw before uh, and we turned it into this. Uh, and we said, look, uh, this is really the area that everyone wants to be. Uh, and no one seems to want to be regulated by time. Me forcing you to move after an hour doesn't seem to be working well for anyone. So we have, we're just going to do this. Re remember, the equation of turnover is one of two things. I'm either going to impose time or price on you. So we decide to move away from time uh, and instead just do it straight by price. So zone one, which is actually north of here, would be north of Oglethorpe to the river. That's Martin Luther King. That's Haversham. This is one zone. $2 an hour, which is what we're already charging at the, the, the garage at Ellis Square. And uh, by the way, I, no time limit to it. You pay as long as you think you need to pay. Now the trick there is you have to be setting the price high enough that you still induce some level of turnover. Uh, we've got another zone, $1 an hour. It's not quite as sought after as this central zone. And then we've got areas in here that were originally proposed as time zones. And why did we propose them as time zones? Those are primarily residential areas. Uh, and once again, this is a mixed use environment. We have to protect the folks who actually live downtown. So we've done residential permits here for years. And so what we proposed in these areas was, all right, two to four hours, you can park in here, uh, but then you got to move unless you have a residential permit. And that is the original uh, plan as was presented. Um, I would note council decided to somewhat split the baby and allow the plan to take place north of Liberty, so in here. And then we'd come back later and look at South of Liberty. Uh, one other thing, and this goes back to that uh, graph I showed you, uh, talking about the psychology of parking. Uh, this is when they went out and they looked at the entire uh, uh, supply of on-street parking that we had. Uh, it never got more than about 65, 70% filled. So we have spaces, they're available. Our problem, I'm gonna go all the way back, was people doing this when that existed. <laughs> now I'm gonna go all the way forward. So we had the spaces, we just had to manage them. We had to induce people into thinking about those other spaces that were available. Uh, so one of the interesting things that we now have is data. Uh, one of the, as a part of the upgrades, we put out 210 of those parking kiosks that you now see on the street. Uh, and they, have certainly much better tracking capability than the single head meter that we were using. And so for the first time ever, we're actually getting data. Uh, I'm gonna take you to a typical Monday. This is April 30th. Uh, the blue line represents if you go up to a meter and you just pay, you're gonna, the time that you did it, you're gonna appear on that blue line. And then let's say you, pay, you paid for three hours you're going to be on this green line for three hours. So green is our active transactions. Blue would be new ones every hour. So Monday, interesting with active transactions, we don't hit our peak 
till about noon. A lot of people would assume that you just hit your peak at maybe 9 or 10 in the morning when everyone shows up, but you don't actually, on a Monday, hit it until noon. Then it starts to drop off and then it levels out, levels out about 5, 6 p.m. and that's a Monday. And this is typical. We, we track this every day, every week. Let's go to Wednesday. This is interesting. Uh, you still hit your peak about noon, maybe a little later. It's actually more transactions now coming in and you do start to drop off, but instead of leveling out, uh, activity starts rising again at night. Friday, same thing, but even more transactions. Oh, and we're not hitting, we're kind of hitting our peak about one or two o'clock now later in the day. And we're almost as high at seven o'clock as we are at one. <laughs> Saturday. Uh, remember that graph that I showed you when people said when they were having parking problems? That it rose throughout the day. Well, that's exactly what's happening here. Uh, Initial peak is a, about 11, 12 o'clock, and then it doesn't really drop. There's a slight drop off here, but it kind of keeps rising throughout the day. I've seen this graph when it's even more pronounced on a Saturday. Uh, and we're, we're, our parking activity is about 20% higher on a Saturday as opposed to a Monday. So for the first time, we're actually able to think about how people are using the system and making decisions based off of that. The other thing that we're starting to get see is occupancy. So uh, you can't get exact occupancy off of this because the, the problem, it'll tell me how many spaces are paid on a block. Occasionally, maybe there's a police car on that block or someone with a residential permit doesn't track those. But we can factor for that. Uh, so when we put this plan into place, we realized very quickly, hey, we're going to have to actually help people get to those other spaces that they really ne don't necessarily want to be at. Everyone wants to be up here. And so we made a commitment. We said, we're going to work with Chatham Area Transit. We're going to do express shuttles. And, and, and we had particular uh, standards for those shuttles. We said, look, it has to be simple. And it has to be high frequency. And in our minds, high frequency was 10 minutes. You shouldn't really wait more than about 10, 12 minutes for a bus. So we worked with Chatham Area Transit. We came up with two routes, one going to Forsyth Park. It's just, it is an incredibly simple route. And then an the east-west, oh, by the way, as it turns out, the route <laughs> now, uh, now, of course, this doesn't, this, this, this doesn't really make any sort of point unless that route is successful, unless people are actually riding that route. So let's look at that. Um, this old, very complicated thing looking uh, actually isn't all that complicated. It, it's, hey, how many passengers per hour is the bus moving. So uh, Chatham Area Transit, these are their regular routes. And you can see it's about 24, 23, 20. Uh, Abercorn is a really, that, that, that's sort of the spine of the city and really of the whole of the system. Moving about 23 people an hour. Um, the Forsyth shuttle is moving 28. Put in context, it's moving more people than CAT's regular routes on a per hour basis. Uh, the other one, yes, is moving less, but we sort of anticipated that. We, we knew everyone was going to be crowding onto that four size route. Um, consequently, we've already ordered, and well, we ordered a while ago, they should be coming larger buses uh, because they're, just, they're needed at this point. Uh, so, I'm standing here talking to you about parking 
And I have not said much about uh, another part of it. But look, I, I can't build more spaces in the heart of downtown. Uh, we spend now about a million and a half dollars on shuttle systems, but we also spend now substantial amounts of money starting to on bike and pedestrian infrastructure. And my reasoning for that is simple. I need to give everyone as many options as possible for getting here because I don't necessarily have the spaces in Johnson Square for everyone who wants to be there. So I should be investing in that. Um, so uh, the Truman Linear Trail, trail? <laughs> uh, we provide the local match for that. And that's been our role quite a bit. We, do the, we provide the local match for quite a few projects. We're an enterprise fund. We can do that. We should do that. Uh, it helps to jumpstart projects in this area. Uh, we've also been working uh, with traffic engineering, on-street facilities, Liberty to Wheaton, that's already designed. That should be going to city council very soon. Uh, that will give East Side a, a really important link into downtown. Uh, Lincoln Street, why do I mention Lincoln Street? There's already a bike facility there. Not really. Uh, it's old, it's falling apart. We also wanted to experiment perhaps with protected bike lanes, which I know many of you all are doing, but it's in its infancy here. Um, also, if you've seen a bike rack downtown, this is a really simple one. We fund them. You're a business. You want a bike rack in front of your business. Just come to us and say, I want a bike rack. We'll put one out. We don't charge you. It's just a really simple way to get facilities out there. Um, and that's not to say we're not going to build any new parking, but what we know is any parking we build is going to be in connection. One, it's going to be peripheral, and two, it's going to be in connection with a development that's already happening. Uh, this is formerly Savannah River Landing, now Eastern Wharf on the eastern side of downtown. Uh, we have agreed to build one, at this point, one 700 space garage to help support this development, which will be 320 apartments, 30,000 square feet of retail, two large restaurant parcels, and a Riverside Park. We have an option to build a second one if we need it. Um, I'll end with this. Uh, we are looking at uh, payment in lieu of parking as a part of our zoning changes. Um, we're in general looking at ways that perhaps reduce minimum parking requirements, either for things like affordable housing or if you are on a high frequency transit line. Um, just one idea thrown out. Uh, we really want to start moving into wayfinding. We have a couple of RFPs out, requests for proposals, looking at that. Um, we have one R request for proposal out asking folks, hey, if we wanted to fill a gap of late night workers, say new, midnight to or 10 p.m. to 5 a.m., and buses really aren't all that efficient to do that in. That's going to require more on-demand service. We're looking for partners, perhaps, with that. Uh, we put a request for proposals out, and we already we have three bids back that we're starting to evaluate, and we'll probably make a decision pretty soon. And I'm I'm pretty excited about that one uh, because it's our first foray into potentially partnering up with a rideshare company. Um, and then lastly, bike share. This is the one I actually hear the most about. Uh, if you have three hours, I can tell you about our long, interesting journey through bike share. Uh, but uh, the, we're working with Chatham Area Transit now, and I think we will actually have that system, a system up in the next year or so. Uh, we have a miniature version of a system now out of Ellis Square. Uh, but when I say bike share, I mean an actual system that go, takes you where you want to go. OK, I'm done. And I'm going to sit down now and shut up. Thank you. My name is Bob Gibbs, and I specialize in urban retail districts. And I've been asked to give a general broad comparison overview between uh, Broughton Street, downtown Savannah, and Charleston. And um, even though both cities are only about 90 miles apart, uh, they're very different, and for some reason, when I um, 
when I go to either city, people always tell me which city they like the best. People are very passionate about one city or the other. Uh, both cities have a, a fairly similar demographic. For example, within a mile radius, uh, Savannah has 20,000 people and downtown Savannah has about 23,000. So uh, demographically and from an income point of view, uh, they're very similar. Uh, Broughton Street um, is about the same length as King Street in Charleston, and, uh, but they're very different in character and design. Both streets have a lot of national chains. I don't know Broughton Street mix, but I know Charleston has about 30% national chains and about 30% local, one of a kind, and about 30% regional retail. I have been working with uh, the city of Charleston, or in the city of Charleston since the 1980s. I was the urban planner on Charleston Place for the Taubman Company. I worked for them when they built that hotel and that retail center. And was called in about 20 years ago by the mayor's office because they were afraid that Charleston was getting overrun with national retail. Uh, they wanted national retail, but there was a perception that it was about 70 to 80% of the retail. When we researched it, we found that it was about 22 to 23 percent. But uh, because the stores were open 20, uh, so late, and because uh, everybody knew the brands, it created an optical, an optical illusion that it was mostly retail. Uh, Broughton Street is a two-way street. King Street in Charleston is a one-way street. Uh, King Street only has parallel parking on one side. Broughton Street has parallel parking on both sides but they both have parallel parking, which is unusual. A lot of cities of this size have diagonal parking. When I visited Broughton Street, I did not see parking meters. Are there parking meters on Broughton Street? Yep. I missed them. <laughs> they're in the middle of the block. Oh, they're where? About in the middle. Mm. They're oh, relatively the new. Oh, with the kiosk? Yeah. Okay, I overlooked that. Uh, Broughton Street is very straight, very linear. It has taller buildings than King Street in, in, and, uh, in Charleston. And it has a more modern feel. It's a wider street. King Street is only uh, really two narrow lanes wide. Broughton Street is wider. Both streets have a lot of national retail. Um, I don't know the exact percentage on Broughton Street, but they both have a lot of national retail. Uh, this is very interesting because we work for, we've worked for hundreds and hundreds of cities and almost every city we work in tell us that they do not want any national retail on their main street. There's a very strong bias against that and uh, these two districts have a lot of retail. I know the, um, in Charleston it was their policy to have the types of stores that people like to shop at on King Street whether or not they were national or not. Uh, King Street is uh, really, or downtown Charleston is really made up of four shopping districts. It is a very beautiful shopping district primarily because of Mayor Riley. Mayor Riley was the mayor for 40 years and I call him the brand manager of Charleston. He and his staff very carefully approved every storefront, every awning, every sign, and they kept them to extremely high standards. And when the mayor started 40 years ago, Charleston was not that attractive. It was really a, um, a, a, a Navy town. It had just had a hurricane. And most of the buildings were in pretty bad repair and none of them were really built to an historic standard. This is the mayor of Niagara Falls, Canada, whom I brought to meet with the mayor. We brought a lot of mayors to meet with uh, Mayor Riley as an example. Mayor Riley really required that every building be built uh, and renovated to, a, to really the highest possible standards from a historic point of view. Uh, this building was all boarded up and uh, was renovated to this high standard, for example. Um, because of that, uh, King Street was really a pioneer for national retailers to leave the mall and to open in downtowns. This was a Saks Fifth Avenue which opened on King Street about 20 years ago. And uh, King Street has become the preferred destination for the best retailers when they come into the Charleston market. There are two other regional shopping centers 
in Charleston, but given a choice, the, uh, the better retailers like Apple prefer to locate on King, um, Saks Fifth Avenue preferred to open on King Street. The rents, uh, by our research, Charleston's rents are about $58 a square foot per year. King, uh, Savannah's uh, Broughton Street rents are about $36 a square foot per year. I'm not fully confident in these numbers because we've used third party sources for this and these, uh, they can really be pretty significant. There are rents on Broughton Street that are over $60 a square foot in some cases and there are some rents in Charleston that are over $100 a square foot. But on average, this is as close as we can come to. Um, Char but I was surprised that Charleston was so much higher, King Street was so much higher than Broughton Street. Uh, the mayor, like I said earlier, and Char Mayor Riley in Charleston really welcomed national chains to the downtown. Uh, his philosophy was if you live on the peninsula, I'd rather you be able to walk to go shopping rather than have to drive to the mall. That's a very unusual uh, philosophy. We worked with the other King Street in Alexandria, Virginia about 15 years ago and overwhelmingly those residents said we want to do when we don't we want to drive to the mall and do all of our mall shopping in the mall and on King Street we just want uh, tourist shops and that was their uh, philosophy and that's what we gave them. Uh, this is a pottery barn on King Street for example uh, it's built per National Historic Register standards and I know the mayor's office and his staff very carefully picked out awning colors and signage and colors of brick and such so that every building would be built to a high standard. And uh, initially, if you built to this standard in Charleston 30 or 40 years ago, you would be the only good looking building on your block. And it took about 25 years to get to a tipping point where uh, you had so many that uh, they really reinforced each other. Uh, Broughton Street has a number of very fine historic buildings and a number of very well uh, restored historic buildings, uh, but not every building has been built to the standard uh, that I think they could have been. Uh, this is a McDonald's on Broughton Street. This would not be allowed uh, in King Street. Um, they would allow a McDonald's on King Street, but they would require that it be built to a very high standard, different than what you see there. And this probably, I don't know the story of this, but this was probably an older building that was somehow grandfathered in. Uh, there's also the River District uh, in uh, Savannah, as you know, it's more of a tourist destination. Uh, that seems to be built to uh, really no standard at all. The uh, buildings and the awnings and such are what you would typically find in a really a cheap suburban shopping district. And I was surprised really at there's really, it seems to be, I don't know this for sure, but there seems to be a lack of any minimum design standards along the River District. Uh, this is definitely a tourist location, but uh, it's really not the kind of places that tourists like to go to. Tourists like to go to historic districts and they like to feel, uh, be in a place that looks different and of a higher standard than their hometown. Um, uh, Broughton Street has a uh, streetscape that is different than Charleston. It's mostly concrete with some bricks. The uh, trees have some sort of interesting synthetic fiber around the trees. It's probably porous, but it's a very unusual looking sort of man-made uh, condition. I haven't seen this before. It has some sort of plastic epoxy uh, condition around the trees, uh, which is really, un I think, uh, unworthy of such a fine historic district. And there's probably plans to restore Broughton Street mm -hmm. to bring it up to a high, higher standard. But right now the streetscape in the public realm uh, is very dated and really not worthy of this sort of district. King Street uh, was, re was restored about um, 20 years ago to a very high standard. They have granite uh, curbs, uh, real uh, bluestone, and the bluestone was designed to uh, have a flame defend authentic type look. And uh, King Street generally has a very, very high public realm. What's interesting in Charleston is that there are lots of places in Charleston that have beautiful storefronts, but they still have the old-fashioned light poles and overhead wires in front of them, but they're still performing well. In some of those districts, we know the stores are doing over a thousand square foot.
King Street, uh, Middle King has a deflected view in it. It's a one-way street. Uh, it has uh, the demographics again. Uh, Charleston has about 300,000 people within 10 miles, and Savannah has about 250. So they're very close from a demographic point of view. Um, the average incomes, Charleston, downtown Charleston's five mile radius has a much higher average income than Savannah, 80, 83,000 versus 50,000. Uh, both downtowns have a lot of hotel rooms. King Street has more hotel rooms than downtown, uh, than Broughton Street. Uh, this is the uh, uh, Charleston Place, the hotel and retail shops that I worked in about 35 years ago. Um, this, this is the amount of overnight tourists. Uh, Savannah has more overnight tourists than Charleston. This was surprising to me, but Savannah uh, wins in that category. Uh, annual. Visitor spending. Uh, even though Charleston has fewer visitors, they're spending more um, as an aggregate. Um. Uh, square footage, is that square footage? Total retail square, Total retail square footage. similar mix of uh, national and ret local retailers. Uh, Charleston, this is Charleston's Peninsula. Charleston is really made up of four primary shopping districts, the Middle King, the Upper King, the Public Market area over here, and the French Quarter. Uh, Savannah really has three primary districts, Broughton Street, the River Di Tourist District, and then the Historic Square areas. The Historic Square, area, uh, this is King Street, it's one way, two lanes, one way, mostly with just parallel parking on one side. In some cases, there's parallel parking on two sides. The uh, King Street, uh, Charleston has the, his, the uh, historic market area. This is their city market. It's about a two or three hundred year old city market. This has become the number one tourist attraction in Charleston. It's a really great public market. I was to see, sad to see that Savannah had a public market one time that they tore down for a parking garage. Uh, Savannah has, of course, the River District, Broughton Street, and then all of the uh, historic shops around the squares. The historic uh, area around the squares where we are right now is probably the best uh, neighborhood commercial shopping district in the country. I can't think of one that's better. Uh, it has almost the ideal mix of restaurants and specialty retailers and really some of the best public realm and urbanism that I've seen anywhere at all. Uh, last year I was asked by the USA Today to rate the best shopping district in the country and the best top ten and we rated Savannah's historic district as the number one uh, shopping district in the country, urban shopping district in the country. Uh, Broughton Street again is wider, it's two ways, two lanes, two wide lanes with parallel parking on both sides and it generally has much taller buildings than in Charleston. Uh, this is the River District. So it's very interesting comparing the two. I'm, I'm not an expert on Savannah, so I may have made some misstatements. These are just anecdotal observations that I've made during three visits. But it's so interesting that both districts are, are similar in terms of demographics, a uh, little different in terms of tourism and uh, spending power. But both have become models, uh, both Savannah and Charleston, have become models for what uh, the new urban retailers are doing. The uh, better retailers right now are leaving the malls and they're seeking highly walkable uh, historic districts like Charleston, Savannah. The, uh, the better retailers right now are preferring to locate in historic districts that are built to very high standards. They want the predictability that if they spend a million or two on their storefront, that the buildings next to them will have a very high standard. And a lot of the retailers right now will actually look at your historic district regulations. They will attend your planning commission and city council meetings before they make a decision to move into your city. 
And if it looks like your city is too easy or that you have too flexible of historic standards, they will move on to another city. So Urban is in right now, and uh, thank you very much. We've got time for questions, if anyone has questions. Sean, why don't you come up here? Okay. There you go. Any questions? Yes. Sean? Nope. Oh. Question for Bob. Um, I'm Greg Esterman with the Town Center LLC. You just mentioned in your USA Today article you ranked Savannah's retail district number one. Mm -hmm. Just thinking back in the last 10 minutes of your stats, mm -hmm. Charleston has five times as much square footage and you said is built to a much higher standard. Mm -hmm. What are the top couple reasons you pull out of what you were talking about that makes Savannah well, number one? Uh, I, I felt that the, the walkability of the historic dis district, it's very subjective of course, but uh, Charleston, as great as it is, Charleston's probably a number two or tied for number one. I was only allowed to do one per, dis one per region of the country. Uh, but so Charleston is very linear. It's a peninsula. And, it's re and when you go one or two blocks either side of King Street, they become just pretty nice neighborhoods, but they're not shopping districts. And what I like about Savannah is that it's broad so that you can go to Broughton Street, you can walk four or five blocks in either direction and still have some of the best uh, walkable shopping districts in the country. So it's really just more the geography of the size, the layout rather than the quality. Anybody else? Do you think that this policy of excluding national retailers benefits the city? Well, it, uh, emotionally it does. A lot of people really believe that if there is a William and Sonoma or an Apple store or an REI sporting goods, a lot of people really believe that if that goes into their downtown that it's going to ruin their life. And uh, people tell me that all the time. You know, their kids are going to be deviants, they're gonna, their house values are going to go down, <laughs> they're going to lose their job. And people feel very emotional about that. Uh, statistically, that's not true. Statistically, a district like King Street or Broughton, where you have a mix, uh, the independent retailers have significantly higher sales because they bring tens of thousands of people to the district on a regular basis, and these are people that are going shopping. So if you're an independent shoe store, the best place to be is next to a, a national store that sells national shoes, you know, to be next to Saks Fifth Avenue. So statistically, it's not true. But emotionally, it's overwhelmingly, uh, we hear probably 9.5 out of every 10 cities we work in hire us. In fact, one city recently hired us to write a code to prohibit all national chains from opening into downtown, except the chains that the city council people like to shop at. <laughs> That's true. So uh, the attorney told them that was unconstitutional, but that was their intent. So it's, it's really true. I personally think it's more sustainable. You're, it's more sustainable to have all the stores people like in a central shopping district rather than it is to have them spread out over the suburbs. I don't think it's that sustainable for people in Old, old Town, Alexandria, Virginia to have to drive out to Tyson's Corners to go to the mall. I'd rather have it like Mayor Riley's model where you can walk or ride your bike to the shops. I think that's more sustainable, but I'm very much in the minority and most people are very much opposed to that. It's, it's very interesting, they, uh, they, uh, and I, I don't know why, I can't get into the motives, but I think Charleston and Savannah have done a good job because most of those stores have been built to a very high standard, and they, they just have a sign of a national chain on them. Hi, this is a question for Sean. Um, hey. Thank you for the presentation. You oh, may have hey. mentioned this already, and if you did, I'm sorry. How much um, is your annual budget, and how is the parking management program funded? Sure. Uh, we're an enterprise fund, uh, self-sustaining. Uh, we'll, our budget this year is somewhere in the neighborhood of $15 million, um, which for the assets that we have is about average, uh, maybe a little bit more. Uh, we 
any net revenue that we get, we basically reinvest. Uh, the, the shuttle system at this point is costing us about a million two and going up because we're, we're actually about to expand the hours to midnight um, on that system. Uh, we also make contributions, once again, to the bike system. Uh, we also make contributions, I did not have this up, um, but we fund police officers now mm. whose entire job is in and around parking garages, which it just so happens to all be downtown. Mm. Uh, so we fund eight of those positions now. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's, we're, in a, we're an enterprise fund, but in many ways we're, we're sort of a reinvestment fund. Sean and Parker, um, near the end of your presentation, you mentioned a new development, which a wharf front or something. Oh, e Eastern Wharf, they, they're, they're rebranding themselves now, apparently. So. so at the start of your presentation, you mentioned that you are an unusual entity and that you are the number one or largest provider of parking garage spaces. That particular project, you mentioned you're building, I think it was six or 700 car garage. How do you determine how much of that that development is needing to fund and how much you're willing to fund? Good question. Uh, we had long and not necessarily the happiest meetings with the developer on that question. So uh, just broadly, broad strokes of that particular deal uh, as, it, as it appears we will have it. That's a 600 space garage and if you're the developer you basically want to go to the city and, and say, well, you're going to manage around the garage, but we want to make sure that we have access to all 600. And we say, well, that, that's nice, but no. <laughs> um, we need to make sure that we've uh, cut out some spaces, at least for potentially for commuters. Because our interest in that garage, uh, since it's on the east side, is commuters coming from the islands uh, and from other points east. So we had a long back and forth with the developer about the number of spaces. Practically speaking, on the ground when it's open, uh, it's not gonna matter as much. And I say that uh, because the day that it opens, um, you know, it's, we're gonna initially say whoever wants to be in the garage can be in the garage and we're gonna start tracking numbers from there. Um, all right, we've got 100 commuters in. Uh, the retail store that moved in uh, wants five spaces, no problem. Where this really starts to become an issue is when you start reaching your cap number. Um, and that discussion was tied in with, okay, well, when we start hitting the cap number, that's probably what triggers needing the second garage. And so there was a lot of back and forth about that. Uh, but we have carved out spaces in the agreement to make sure that we have Space, spaces for our interest, which is commuters. Um, and I know they have spaces for their interest, which is room for retail, restaurant customers. This question is for Robert. Uh, I lived in Savannah for almost five years, and I'm pleasantly surprised to hear that you've rated Savannah as a number one shopping district. Um, I have noticed that a lot of the local retailers have kind of removed themselves from Broughton Street, seemingly mm -hmm. due to increased rents and mm -hmm. some outside developers coming in and purchasing a property. Uh, some of those spots uh, have seemed to um, sit empty for a while. Mm -hmm. And for instance, a Mark by Mark Jacobs store left, sat empty for about four years and has since just mm -hmm. become, uh, has since been filled. So what would your suggestions be to find a proper balance for local and you know, that, local, regional and national? That's a really great question. The ideal mix, in my opinion, is about a third local, a third regional, and a third national. If you get a much higher than 40% national, then you really lose your character and the rents go so high that it hurts the local retailers. So there are ways that you can help uh, local retailers stay downtown but it takes, uh, the city has to be involved in that. In Charleston, we design, uh, we, we uh, zone districts, or we were losing the antique dealers in Charleston due to high rents. So we set up another antique district in Upper King where the rents were much lower, and then they uh, improved the streetscape and they promoted Upper King to be the next 
area. And that happened. The designers went there, the antique, the home furnishings went there. So it's technically possible, but a city really has to plan to, to help the local retailers. Otherwise, these downtowns are getting bought by real estate investment trusts, and they don't want local retailers. They want credit-worthy tenants. So you really have to be very um, deliberate to make it happen. And it's a mistake not to have the local retailers there, very much so. That's a trend, by the way. A real estate investment trust right now are not buying malls because the malls are closing. About a third of all the malls are going to be closed in the next five years. And uh, so the REITs are coming in buying downtowns. They're, they're actually buying whole blocks of downtowns. That's the next trend. How, well, the city can, uh, there's always different affordability levels in an urban area. So the city can figure out what area is a weaker area for retail and they can design, they can design and promote uh, uh, that for the uh, retailers that can afford the rent. Um, a lot of local retailers can afford higher rents because sometimes when the, low, when the stronger retailers come in, it increases their sales. Rents should be about 10% 10, 10 of your sales and uh, sometimes they can afford to go there. But there, it, it's got to be calibrated for your city. There's not a one size fits all. But there are ways uh, that it should happen and you shouldn't just let the free market move people out of the downtown. I mean I'm for the free market but it needs a little guiding hand too. Somebody else? Oh, I, think. I have three parking questions. Um, Here you go. I think they're all related to management. Um, the first is, do you charge for the shuttles? No, we, we do they're, not. They're free once somebody's paid for a space for them. They're they, free if anybody just walks in. Right? Anyone can use them. They're okay. free. Um, you talk about um, your studies showing that you had 30% um, capacity remaining and they were just in the wrong places. Do you have any sense of what the what the max capacity is? I mean, is it 100 percent utilization, or is that never really obtainable in a large region? Um, I don't know. Well, uh, outside of some some outlying urban examples, I don't know if 100 percent is is com is ever completely attainable. I think you have a core area of about six to eight hundred spaces, and that's where everyone wants to be. Um, and if left to its own devices, let's say you took up all the meters, there's no, no time limits, nothing, take out all regulation, those 600, 800, 6 to 800 spaces probably are full all the time. There's your 100%. I, I just answer my own question. <laughs> um, uh, the, the, the system's trying to incentivize people to get out of, necess not necessarily go to those at six to eight hundred spaces as their first option, but providing cost tiers and based on how much you want to pay, you make the selection of where you want to go. Then my job is to get you still where you want to go, whether that's on a shuttle, a bicycle, wherever, whatever. And, and last question, um, the, in a city like Savannah that has, a, certainly the historic district, that has a very strong historic plan, um, lot sizes are limited, uh, uh, areas for parking, with the city being, are you the only provider of no. structured parking or just the major provider? We're, we're, not, we're not the only one, but I, if I had to peg a percentage to it, we're probably 75% 70 per, of the off-street parking. So in a city with those characteristics, how do you handle somewhat large-scale, mid-scale to large-scale uses that come into the system and the grid, like, for instance, the new Perry Lane Hotel? Good so, question. How, where are their parking spaces coming from? Are they providing them? Are you providing them? Uh, this is a very good question, uh, and it is one that we struggle with. Uh, so let's take the Perry Lane Hotel. Good question. So they built, uh, I believe, 90 spaces underground to that hotel. Now that's going to serve primarily their guests, but people have to work there. And we don't even, even if the garages in that area kind of had capacity, they're mostly full, but they're not even really that close. Um, but that's where the shuttle system comes in. So Perry Lane Hotel, they come to me and they say, well, I need 30 employee parking spaces. I'm going to look at them and say, well, we have them at the Liberty Garage, which is technically on the other side of downtown, but the shuttle system, as it just so happens, has a stop in front of that garage 
and a stop two blocks from your hotel. So my, the capacity that we have, I'm trying to get people to use that capacity and taking away the excuses of it's too far away or there's no way I can get to it. Um, but it's a struggle. Uh, we have developments, redevelopments happening right now on Bay Street and other areas where I, the garages I have are full. I, I, I don't have capacity there. I have capacity at garages that are even farther away, um, but that's a discussion we end up having with the developer. And I think developers that come from out of town are sort of surprised initially that, oh, there's really no space, no, those facilities are full, but we've built this system so that you can use periphery. Mm -hmm. So in, in that particular case, or any of those types of cases, did you negotiate the required number of on-site spaces with the developer? And is there any sort of valet system where they can take their guest cars far away? So mo the, I'll start with the first question. Uh, the, 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 mostly the zoning is the zoning. Now, we have started to experiment more. Um, the, the, our, our, our zoning code is seriously due for an upgrade. I think everyone knows that. Um, variances are, pro are, are, are somewhat common. Um, but we've also started to experiment with things like payment in little parking. Uh, so smaller developers, we end up talking to them about their, mainly their employee choices because they, most of the time they'll come to us already customer parking they kind of got worked out already it's their employees uh, larger scale developments uh, we tend to work with them now at least throughout their development process uh, and just making sure the, the and, and it's interesting the there's been a lot of discussion about hey you don't need minimum parking requirements and I think there's a case to be made definitely in the future that you, you, you may not need minimum parking requirements, but real world on the ground right now at this moment, there's a basic level of parking that you need. I mean, even as I often joke to people, I feel like a drug dealer trying to wean people off my product, I, <laughs> I, I, I still, there's still a basic level that you need. Um, Okay. Are there, are we out of time? Yeah. Are okay. we? Okay, I have to put a plug in for my book. Uh, I do have, I have a book called Urban Retail where we talk about a lot of the top shopping districts in the country and about how the dynamics of how they work. It's available in the bookstore here at the conference. Okay, thank you very much. Yep, thank you. Thank you.